former minister and founder of Something or Other Publishing, Wade Franson, is the host of Created in the Image of God, a series that examines the role of religion in society, from messianic returns to the emotive responses transmitted through our culture. Wade fearlessly addresses reality claims from all directions, objectively exploring their compatibility with Holy Scripture. Tonight's episode, By Grace Alone, with Craig Ireland. Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Wade Franson, created in the image of God. I'm coming to you live tonight from Kissimmee, Florida, where I'm on vacation with my family. And so I'm not in the normal studio. I'm a little bit um, out of my element. But so is our guest tonight in that it is not evening here in America on summertime, daylight savings time. He's coming to us from down under. Let's welcome Craig Ireland into the studio. How are you, Craig? Doing well, thank you. On a, uh, it's a, it's a nice warm Wednesday morning for us, and I assume Tuesday evening for you guys and and the majority of the audience. Well, I think the audience really is scattered all around the world, so I don't I don't really know where all they are, but I know for me. I'm one hour off, one hour off the normal time. Plus, uh, it is daylight savings time as of yeah. a couple of weeks ago. You you had an interesting experience this last week with that. What? Tell us about what happened. <laughs> yeah, I um, I had my uh, my uh, doctoral review committee just completing my my doctorate, and uh, I'm doing my doctorate out of a, a prestigious university in uh, in the U.S. on the East Coast. And um, I had a had an appointment, a Zoom appointment, to sit with my review committee and go over my proposal. It was a defense of my dissertation, and um, it was my time scheduled seven a.m. I think it was a Tuesday morning for me, so a Monday afternoon for these gentlemen, these professors. And I was getting up at six a.m., had an hour to get ready, get my coffee, and just feel like I was in the zone. And I woke up to an email saying, "Where are you, man? We've been waiting twenty minutes." So the daylight saving time kicked in, and. Uh, my my calendar didn't update and those guys well they had they had no idea so um we rescheduled but boy it was uh it was awkward and um and difficult that's for sure and those doctoral committees they can be a little persnickety right yeah i think that's putting it generously i think i think some of the audience would have gone through those experiences they uh yeah they're very fastidious on the you know crossing t's and dotting i's so right. missing an appointment or even being late is uh it's very very faux pas yeah. So tell us a little bit about that degree and that dissertation. What is that about? Yeah, I, I'm working on um. This is this is a, a doctorate degree in in practical ministry specifically. I've been a church planter most of my uh, adult life and ministry career, and I lived in the U.S. for a while. We'll probably get into that in in a minute. But having returned to Australia about a year ago, a little over a year, um, I commenced my dissertation looking at conservative churches, not not politically conservative per se, but, but theologically, doctrinally conservative churches and uh, and their decline. So statistically in Australia, um, if I was to sort of describe it to your audience, I might say Australia has a lot more in common with, say, France or Sweden, some of those more continental European, extremely secular cultures. And uh, so conservative churches in Australia are on a pretty steep decline. And, and my dissertation is really just analyzing um, presumptions about that and, and, and what makes people believe the decline is happening and what potential interventions and remedies uh, remedies may be sought to, to correct that. So it's been a wonderful journey. But like anyone knows, you know, doing a doctorate, you feel like at some point along the way, you kind of sell your soul to the extremity of academia. But I'm at the back end, so I can certainly rejoice in, uh, in nearing. I'll be a few months out and I'll be done. So I'm thankful for that. <laughs> and I'm sure it's been a long haul. Mm, How many years? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, four. It'll be it'll be close to four when I'm done. Yeah. Okay. And so now you were actually planting churches in Australia before you moved to the U.S. and uh, before you started the doctrinal dissertation. So mm -hmm. what triggered that? What was the genesis of that? Is it Trans-Pacific move or is it multiple oceans that you move across to, to get here? <laughs> yeah, we're just mostly the Pacific, right, that separates the West Coast of the U.S. and the East Coast of Australia. Um, so I planted churches in Australia most of my adult life and came to a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a fork in the road. Not sure what I would do next. I was anticipating planting another church, but I got a call um, kind of 
deep in East Texas, the buckle of the Bible Belt, to come do some church revitalization, which is a, it's a bit of a, it's, well, it's quite a different animal. I won't understate it. Um, but as a church planter, it, it certainly kind of spoke to the high risk aspect of my personality. I love that idea of <laughs> taking on an immense challenge. And uh, so we spent about mm, three and a half, four years in East Texas, pretty close to the Louisiana border. And then we spent our last couple of years in the U.S. in, in upstate New York, right on the Canadian border. So quite contrasting cultures and especially being a pastor in those cultures, you get to see some wonderful things and some some ugly things. And so it was really, uh, really enlightening. Well, we have a lot of um, sort of intersections here that I'll, I, I just like to quickly touch on. So I did a year in East Texas at a uh, small university, a um, little bit north of you, um, mm -hmm. if you were close to Louisiana. Um, yeah. We were sort of southeast of Dallas um, okay. near Tyler. I know the area um, well, yeah. But um, I was doing my theology degree at that time, and then I ended up in the ministry in Europe. And um, my first assignment really was working in the German office. And my work permit mm. said that I, I was in training to head up a Scandinavian office in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I mentioned that you mentioned Sweden and mm. we called it at that time, I don't know if that's still a term, we called it the North German plane of irreligion, <laughs> right? Because Christ, yeah. you get you get up north in northern Germany and into Denmark, Sweden, and Sweden. Mm -hmm. Now Norway is a bit more religious, but you know religion. Come on, I mean yeah. Yeah. Th they had so achieved socialist utopia mm -hmm. that there was no need for religion anymore, mm -hmm. um, and and the the Enlightenment, you know, had come full circle. Um, you know, much of the Enlightenment had its roots actually in religious pursuits. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, fully baked, uh, you know, they, they, they enlightened themselves, you know, out of <laughs> an understanding about who God was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just, I just think it's interesting. And then, of course, I'm from Canada originally and you were up on the mm -hmm. Canadian border. So, you know, we, we, we have a lot of in common here. And um, that's one of the reasons I wanted you on the show. Um, another thing we had in common was we both lived through some turbulent years here in America between mm. the the 26 election and the presidency in which the pandemic hit mm. and mm. you were here in the US during those times you got to see the exacerbation of traditional differences of viewpoint that had typically in America led to you know going with one president for for usually 8 years Mm -hmm. um, usually we reelected mm -hmm. the president after his first term and mm -hmm. then swinging back mildly towards the other direction after that, you know, and everybody kind of who was involved in politics was kind of aware of how we sort of meandered across the middle of the road from the left to the right. Mm -hmm. um, but now it seems like we try to lurch forward from ditch to ditch. You know, we've become mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. polarized that, you know, one one president gets in and wants to immediately overturn everything the previous president did because the the sort of differences of viewpoint have turned into animosity and into an mm. ism oh, yeah. right yeah. a leftism and a rightism yeah. right uh with with a whole set of beliefs that you know are more ism in nature versus mm. understanding mm -hmm. um so as an as an aussie um and you know the australians have traditionally also looked at america um, with a somewhat critical eye, you know, sort of comparing themselves yeah. and their history and background. You and I talked a little bit about that, but share with me your, your outsider down under perspective of, of those years and that transition in American society to one that is, that is really, no other word describes it versus contentious. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think the nature of polarizing, uh, I'll use your term isms. I think the way in which we sort of presume that those that don't cohere with every you know jot and tittle of our worldview or political persuasion it's not just that they might be wrong we, it's not just that we consider their opinions to be perhaps ungrounded but we consider them to be a villain it's almost like it's almost like there's kind of we have to question the moral fabric of who they are as a person and i got to experience that i i went through those years in like i said deep east texas when COVID hit 
in 2020. Um, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating in saying that living in Texas, um, it was a was a bizarre, it was a very bizarre experience. You know, the Texans basically acknowledged, and where we were more rural, I don't mean if you're in Austin or San Antonio, very different Texas, but I mean, when you're kind of away from the big smoke, the Texans really acknowledged COVID for about six, eight weeks, and then that was it. They, they were done. And so I was I was there pastoring. Yeah, they, they stuck with the original promise of a two week that's lockdown. Right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and they let and it so go on for a little longer. That's right. I lived in that, but I was able to connect with family and friends uh, in Australia. And Australia's on record as, you know, some parts of Australia having the most severe lockdowns of anywhere, even more than China, anywhere in the world. And well, um, Australia, from... Australia had the characteristics where it was more believable that it could work because of the yeah. the lack of density and the, the vast That's distances right. yeah. between people and the yeah. natural isolation inherent in the geography. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and so I, I think for me, that experience was quite unique because I, I empathize with with both realities. So I, 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 I'm not going to say I didn't enjoy living in Texas during COVID because you basically took care of your own level of concern and your own level of caution and safety. If you wanted to mask up, you did. If you wanted to distance, you did. If you wanted to stay home, you did. If you didn't want to, you didn't, right? That, that's very Texan that, you know, the autonomy and the freedom uh, solely relies on, on the individual. And there's some merit. I'm not, I'm not going to come on today and kind of just hate all over that. But I also have the perspective that good friends of mine, people that I pastored, you know, people in my church, good members, good people, um, fit and healthy people, they passed away. And so I recognize that, you know, looking for a balanced perspective and approach on this, I've already said enough way to offend, you know, people in the audience, right? Like, oh, we want him to say more of that. Or we want him because well, we want well, to. No, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right in there and, and, and do Go the ahead. same and say that my dad, who lives down near Tyler, mm. uh, he moved there many years after I went to school there. There wasn't a family. We, we were up in Alaska. And in Alaska, yeah, okay. you know, the joke is, you know, to all the Texans, you know, we're glad you have such a big state because there's room enough for all of you in it, right? And, you know, then why don't you go back there? And secondly, <laughs> stop talking about how big your state is or we'll cut ours in half and turn you into the third largest, the <laughs> right? But um, yeah. but so my dad was was yeah. moved there for whatever reason, and he's mm. older and his hearing's really bad, mm. but it's not that bad. But he he, during the pandemic, he would go into stores without a mask or anything and of course, he's, you know, considerably at risk because he was in his mid 80s, sure. yeah. at least. Um, and he would just pretend he couldn't hear anybody. So, oh, sorry, I yeah. forgot my hearing. I can't hear you. They'd be like yelling at him, put on a mask. Yeah. And he'd be like, well, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Well played. Well played. <laughs> yeah. And, and no, um, you know, and, and, and we could also get into the whole debate about why those people died. Did they die of COVID or with COVID or did well, they course, die from the vaccine? Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just saying there no. are a variety yeah. of differences of opinion. Those yeah. differences of opinion are coming out. Speaking about isms, I will say this. I, mm. I recently came up with a new t new new uh, phrase. I'd like to know from the audience if I should make T-shirts and start selling them. My T-shirt would say, I believe in science. Who needs evidence? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't I mean to me that perfectly encapsulates yeah. scientism, yeah. right? I yeah. believe oh, yeah. in science. Who needs yeah. evidence? Mm. And uh, you know, the science is, of course, what the journals say it is. And who's buying mm. off the journals these days, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's funding that's flowing. And I, you know, I say to people when I interact with people that seem to kind of boast this concrete knowledge of those things, um, I say, look, I, I claim ignorance. I don't think I really know. But what I do know for sure is you also don't really know is I, I think that um, there is a significant amount of covering up happening. I'm, I'm not conspiratorial by nature at all, actually, but I do know that the populace don't get all the information and they get skewed information. And then where you pick your news and, and sort of where you feel like you fit on the spectrum, you kind of get a different narrative. And you're right. Uh, academic journals, they're funded. There's, you know, there's, there's payments that happen. There's research that gets certain, you know, bonuses and things like that. And so, I think that a healthy dose of skepticism and just a realist view of human nature, not an overly pessimistic view, we don't need to become misanthropes, but a realist view, I think, sets us probably in a safe position to not be not be taken for a ride, uh, but also not to be overly dogmatic on claiming that we have certainty on things that time may tell and time may not always tell. Yep. 
Speaking of which, as I'm looking at the screen here, it almost looks like we're in the same room, like we photoshopped oh. it. You know, the <laughs> divide that. between the cameras there and the curtain, you know, like yeah. my I, we were joking earlier, though, this particular it's a really nice facility. It's it's a it's like a condo, not a and we're in a timeshare, right, which I shared with them. And this is another one of my my own uh, little coined phrases. I call them crime shares, right? I'm not here to promote the purchase of a timeshare. Um, <laughs> although we love our timeshare and I don't want to speak evil of them. But this thing looks like a shower curtain behind me, but it's actually the curtain of um, of our of our wall here. But um, we're gonna we're gonna actually cut to commercial break now. And when we come back, we're gonna start tying this together. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about your time here in America um, and sort of the echo chambers that developed and the mm. differences of opinion is, is because of your because of your title by grace alone. And there are, you know, there are different. I mean, if if there are these kinds of divisive isms within society, mm. religion has always been that way. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even, you know, if you well, I, I won't go there, but um Let's just say that on the issue of grace alone, you know, mm -hmm. the, the debate between grace versus works mm -hmm. um, has raged theologically for, for, I don't know, hundreds of years. You tell me how long that yeah. debate's been raging, right? <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, along the way, people from either party have thrown each other into hell based on mm -hmm. where they come on that, you know, nuanced gray area between grace and works. Right. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll dig into that when we come back with Craig Ireland, don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Welcome to something or other publishing, or as our friends like to call us soup. Soup is a platform that connects authors, readers, and service providers in one convenient place. Choose Soup if you're an author with a great book idea and you're looking for a publisher offering hands-on coaching in some of the best royalties in the business. Or if you're a reader who enjoys engaging with celebrated and emerging authors. We already have over 3,000 of them and more are joining every day. You can even win free books by voting on their book ideas. Or maybe you're a service provider and you're looking to engage with over 3,000 authors. We're here to help. So whether you're an author, a reader, or a service provider, you're in the right place at Soup. Contact us at help at soupllc.com to learn more. Welcome back to Created in the Image of God. I'm your host, Wade Franson. I'm here with Craig Ireland. Just a word about the word from our sponsor, something or other publishing uh, does believe in giving voice to all the different opinions and perspectives that are out there. And um, we were just talking about how echo chambers have formed in the United States and polarization uh, that has increased in recent years. And then we said, we're gonna dive into the topic for tonight by grace alone. Uh, so Craig, tell us a little bit to introduce this topic about your book, um, because we wanna see audience participation and uh, we'll be giving away a copy of your book, as we always do, to the audience member who has the um, most liked quote tonight by you. And um, we'll be so tell us a little bit about that book, why you wrote it, and what what that title signifies to you and to the reader. Yeah, and I, I don't want to come on uh, tonight and take full credit for the book. This book is is a revision rather than something that I've, I've authored from scratch. And it's a revision of a an, uh, 19th century classic, first published, I think, in the 1850s. And the original title is, uh, uh, what is it? I'm, I'm blanking already. It'll come to me in a second. But By Grace Alone is my revised title. And, um, oh, the original was All of Grace by a famous Victorian Baptist preacher. His name was Charles Spurgeon. Some of the audience may know the name, some may not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found this book in my in my own walk with Christ and, and my own kind of discovery of faith really meaningful and impactful early on. But I do recognize that a lot of people do struggle to read older English. And despite Charles Spurgeon being a really great communicator and his, his use of metaphor and his turn of phrase, quite brilliant, genius, in fact, 
I, I realize that there's going to be some alienation of modern audiences because the language is Victorian English and 2024, we, we do have a, a very modern and contemporized style of language. So that was my intention was to kind of revise that and, and do my best to review that. But the book essentially is just about uh, about God's grace and about our need and claim upon God's grace. And Spurgeon does a great job initially in the early part of the book, just talking about our qualification for God's grace. And that is, you know, our qualification is our inability to, to save ourselves. that when it comes to relationship with God, um, God's looking for us to, to lay claim upon him, to reach out. But God's not looking for us to earn, you know, religious merit or anything of that nature. And that's really where the book positions itself in a very we might say evangelical, Protestant, you know, maybe even a reformed perspective of God's grace rather than perhaps views of salvation by works or earning or buying salvation or anything of, of that nature. And so the book kind of then goes on to talk about, well, saving grace is saving, but grace does have a result in your life. And hopefully it is it is a refining, uh, it's a refining virtue. It, it helps you to grow and to become more christ-like and to produce those virtues of christ so yep by grace alone is the title but saving grace is never alone it does produce in us the fruit of of righteousness and the book talks about that as well so the title it's a little bit of a bit of a i don't know how to describe it. it's trying to get the attention right it's trying to, to to attract people to say look dig in have a read see what you think you may agree with some disagree with others but it does open a conversation about the nature of god's grace in our lives so your your doctorate is more practical, mm. not necessarily theological. So right. how does right? So I'm and, and I don't know enough about it, but just based on what mm. you told us, it is. So how does how does this idea of the book tie into in practical terms when you go out to plant churches, especially as you say, um, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. You're, mm. you're bucking the trend. You're a salmon swimming upstream because the general trend is away from religion. And yet you're out yeah. trying to plant churches in, in Australia. Mm. And um, how does how does that all work together? Yeah, and I think motivation is everything. I, I really think state of the heart and, and mind frame, you know, is, is really everything when it comes to why we do certain things that we do, even political discourse or social engagement or humanitarian and philanthropic endeavors, I think mindset is is key and motivation is key so behind this book and even behind my, my broader work in my doctoral dissertation is about not just asking application questions of praxis we might say but questions behind the heart and the motivation and i think one of the things um and i'll flesh this out when my dissertation's published maybe in a year from now but one of the reasons the conservative church in australia has done so poorly in the broader Australian culture is because it seems to have postured itself time and again as uh, as behavior modification. Now, again, I, I'm not against people bettering themselves and, and working toward a higher standard of morality or, or anything like that. But I think if it doesn't start at a heart level, then any change will be short-lived and will be resented because it will be a reflection upon greater failure. And I think that's, that's where, I, that's what I'm trying to achieve in this book. And that's what I'm also trying to achieve through my, my my research is to show that conservative churches will fail if they keep if they keep promoting a message of well you just need to work hard why aren't you trying more why aren't you giving more on the offering plate for goodness sake haven't you shared the gospel with your family and friends and haven't you gone on the abortion rally and you know all these sorts of things right there's 110 things every day we we're kind of obliged to do if we're gonna lay claim to to being a Christian and I think that what we need to do is restore this message of God's general love and benevolence toward humanity and his grace toward those who with an open hand of faith, not, it's not an exchange, we're not bartering with God, we're not earning with God, we're saying, I acknowledge my need of grace. I know grace is readily available because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And so we lay claim to it. And out of that foundation, I think we have more enduring uh, improvement and, and growth and, and maturation. Well, this is actually really fascinating to me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna dive deep into it right now. Mm. And the reason is, um, again, as as you know, and the audience knows, I'm a former minister. The group that I was in, and a minister in, um, was accused of being a a church of works. Right? We were mm. very yeah. very focused on submission to God. Um, mm. I, I, in recent, we've recently had an imam on the show, and I've I've been really 
contemplating deeply about the, the nature of the faith of Islam, the focus of which is mm. submission to God. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, we were more like Islam than Christianity. We were more like mm. Judaism than Christianity mm. with this mm. intense focus on submission to God. Mm -hmm. And um, we were cult-like in the eyes of the rest of the world. And we had enough doctrinal differences that we were considered to be heretics. So we, mm. were, de we were classified as a cult. But mm. my own personal experience was anything but that. My own personal experience was deep and rich. So I've really thought about this a lot over many decades. Mm. And this is where I'm now going to dive deep into this. And I would completely agree with you that when you say, you know, the, the behavior modification, um, if, if it's not if it's not real, if it's not real. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, but the distinction here is it's coming from the outside in, not from the inside out. But that's that's kind of a platitude. It's yeah, kind of sure. e it's so easy to say, right? But what does that mean? And mm -hmm. let's unpack it for a moment. I believe there's an entirely different dimension to this that is really never discussed. And that is this, that it is the conformity to standards established by human beings mm -hmm. that are not godly standards, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In other yeah. words, God looks at the heart Yes. And he tells us not to judge. Who are you to judge another man's servant? Judge not mm -hmm. lest ye be judged. Whatever, whatever standard you use, mm -hmm. that is the standard that God will use against you if you set yourself up as a judge of other people. Because it's not your job. It's the height of arrogance to judge another man's servant. Who the bleep do you think you are to sit and judge God's children, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know how that works in, you know, if we have kids in our own family, we're yes. constantly trying to, and I, in, in the car today, I told my kids, you know, you're following my bad example. You're sitting there bickering with each other, right? Um, and, um, you know, you need to stop doing that. So the, the point I'm making here is that with God, there is an infinite degree of diversity and every single human being will relate to God differently and will respond to God differently. And to set up a standard of judgment from the outside where human beings are judging the flock. You follow me? Um, mm -hmm. This is the opposite of what God wants. This is the outside in the outside in is you're conforming to the standards of other human beings. It's not that it's wrong to fake it until you make it. Mm. It's that you don't have the right standard in the first place. Mm. It's some humanly devised standard of behavior and code of conduct. Right. Whereas with mm. God, there's infinitely more nuance. And one of the, I, ju I just published an article and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm holding forth now. You're the guest, but I, I this is really, no, go ahead. Yeah. So, and, and I'll give you plenty of ample time to respond. I just published an article today in the Atlantic um, playbook, which I'm very proud of. I'll be, I'll be um, blogging there on a regular basis. I'm a columnist there now. And I contrasted the Cain and Abel story in which Cain is clearly the unrighteous one, right? Mm -hmm. Cain is clearly the one who it says lacked faith in Hebrews yeah. 11. That's right. He specifically lacked the faith needed to produce the fruit, to produce mm -hmm. the work of an offering that met the godly standard. And Abel, the righteous one, is murdered by Cain. I contrasted that story with the um, prodigal son in which God flips the script and this and Jesus does this for this exact reason, in my opinion, of this outward standard. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, but particularly the Pharisees, were the ones mm -hmm. most known, had you know turned their own human set of interpretations and rules into a fine art, which everyone had to conform to. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus completely fixed flips the script mm -hmm. with the prodigal son, because now you have. The good son is the bad son. The son who was always righteous and always doing his father's will stands in 
resentment that the father welcomed the bad son back. So mm. Cain's resentment of Abel becomes the good son's resentment of the sinning son. The same story completely flips the script. Cain becomes Abel, Abel becomes Cain. And the standard of judgment that the Pharisees had used based on everything since the Garden of Eden forward is now turned against them, that their standards of judgment are turned against them. And they fail miserably, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and this just shows the complexity and the diversity of submission to God and the ways in which we submit and the variety of virtues that are all beautiful in God's sight, that when we judge each other, right, the moat in our brother's eye and the beam mm -hmm. in our own eye, right? Um, so this, this outward standard of judgment is that, whereas the internal change through one's own understanding of God's grace mm. that motivates us to submit to the supreme ruler of the universe, but we don't have to change who God made us to be in order to please our father. And yet those who would seek to be the shepherds and the judges of the standard of behavior of the flock would have us change who we are mm. from the outside in. Anyway, I mean, that I, that's just sort of off the cuff, but also mm. not based on stuff I've been pondering and, and even writing about recently. So I don't know if that sort of gets at what you're saying or seeing or how you want to react to all that. Yeah, I think I think where I would where I would add to that conversation is I would add that all of those sentiments um, are certainly consistent with what we read in the Gospels, but it it needs to narrow around the person of Christ, which I, I think you're you're alluding to several times there. I think that um, I would be careful to say that everyone relates to God in their own way without also adding, but Christ is the way to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and. Any attempts to, to reach God, climb to God, strive after God that doesn't locate that faith as Christ, as the apex, I think fails to connect to God in a way that is redemptive and, and beneficial. And I think that all human attempts to, to reach God, which I, I see expressed in all kinds of worldviews, philosophies and religions, they have components of them that you can see are redeeming in that in that if they if they improve society, if they benefit people, if they lift people out of the margins and out of poverty and things like that, then I don't have to be intrinsically anti them, but I do have to, out of love, direct the attention and say, any attempt to, to reach God that isn't through Christ, who is, you know, the only mediator between God and us, um, it does fail in its, you know, I, I would say in its ultimate objective, which is to reconcile us to God, because what is clear is that the world is in a fractured state. There's there's clear evil in the world and, and there's chaos. And Christ has come to bring that message of, of reconciliation. And I think that's tremendously important. Now that may separate me as an evangelical from, from maybe our listeners, and I'm comfortable with that with that distinction, but I feel like that's a tremendously important message to make that we don't find God outside of Christ unless we find him as judge, because we remain in a state of, of irreconciliation. Well, okay. So first of all, I don't, I don't disagree with you. Mm. I'm, I'm excited to engage in this discussion and clarify it mm. in some ways, even for my own friends, not that I'm the arbiter of what's right or wrong. Um, mm. But I, but I get to at least say my opinion matters because mm. it's my show and people are watching oh, me yeah. and my show and maybe they're watching to argue with me and that's great too. Um, yeah. But, it, but even if they're watching to argue with me, then I at least have to clearly state my perspective so they have something to argue with. Right? So, so um, here's what I would say with regard to that. First of all, um, in what way is Christ the mediator? And you know, we, you know, we could go on now for the rest of our lives, yeah. but we could also try to condense it into its most important point. Mm. And what would you say that is? In what way is Christ our mediator? Yeah. Great. And I, so for me, what I like to do when we come to wonderfully crucial questions like this is I want Christ to speak for himself. I don't want to, 
I don't want to pedestal Jesus as Lord and Savior and King and then presume that I'm going to be the, uh, the, like you said, the arbiter or interpreter for who Christ is. I think what Christ communicates clearly in his message and his example is that he reconciles us to God through his sin-free life, substitutionary atoning death, triumphant resurrection. There you have it. So I want to focus on the middle, the beef, right? Because you've, you've listed... Yeah. I mean, you don't have any of it without it, but you've, you know, you got, you got the the piece of sandwich on the one hand, the piece of sandwich on the other, yeah. and the meat mm -hmm. in the the meat in the middle is that he gave his life for us, right? Yes, yeah. he thought it not robbery to be equal with God and emptied himself That's and right. came yeah. and not only lived as a human. Mm -hmm. The sinless life is critical, critical from a theological yes. perspective, yeah. Yeah. in order for his sacrifice to be adequate and transferable because otherwise it has to be for his own sin if he's right. sin free a sinner right. like me can lay claim to the the virtue of it exactly. Sorry to cut you off wide, but and that's yeah. what i meant by adequate but yes yeah you're more articulate in that when i was than i was um but absolutely mm. um but also just from a from that from that overwhelming awe of God's mm. grace, the appreciation of his sacrifice mm. for somebody who, who committed nothing. Like even Pilate said, this man has committed yeah. nothing. Yeah. I find no, nothing in him that would condemn him to death. Mm. Right. That mm. awareness. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and that's the point I wanted to get to when I'd say, I, I 100% agree with you and anyone who seeks to minimize that, mm. Mm. right? Mm -hmm. Has put up a barrier between themselves and God, mm -hmm. right? So if you don't, I mean, and to me, it's that. On the one hand, theologically, yes, I can say, you know, God's law and God's justice and all that. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. And my dad's a welder and an iron worker, and I and, and he mm. focused on the law and the Ten Commandments. And I used to say yeah, that's yeah. like the steel girders of the building. Mm. But not all of us are comfortable walking around on those steel girders the way mm -hmm. he was, or sitting mm -hmm. on that beam swinging like that famous picture of the iron workers eating their lunch up yeah. there. That was yeah. my dad. I said most yeah. of us like the building to be finished with floors and walls and windows yes. and you know, yeah. curtains, even if they look like bath, you know, like <laughs> bathroom uh, shower curtains behind us. It's nice carpet, heating, you know, more fridge, mm. you know, all the things that make it livable. Mm. Um, and, and it's and that that realization of what Christ did as a, mm. as a human being, it, you know, one with supernatural abilities as the son of God, born of a mm. virgin. Mm. Right. Um, <laughs> all of these things being true, um, the appreciation for Christ's sacrifice is, is an emotional response that completely yeah. resonates emotionally, whether we intellectually understand the substitutionary sacrifice or not. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so absolutely every human being must be able to relate to that emotionally and i and i and i sadly know some people who mm. who don't or can't i'm not judging them um because i'm you know i'm i'm not in their shoes right and mm. i didn't grow up like them and they have traits and characteristics that exceed mine but on this point you know the bible talks about he who has been forgiven the most can mm. maybe appreciate it the most. Mm. And from where I come from as a kid and a young man and the hopeless black hole that I was in, my appreciation for that sacrifice of Jesus is, is immense by virtue of my, you know, decrepit youth, <laughs> you know, having been legitimately in jail, for example, for being in a high speed chase with the police up in Alaska in hot pursuit and running off the road at 120 miles an hour and somehow mm. surviving it, <laughs> um, just to name one thing, and that's not even the worst thing I did. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, your I, reaction I have a experience. Well, yeah, because I, you know, I, I, I didn't come to faith in Christ or have this experience until 
I was in my late teen years and um, I grew up in a city that's highest crime in our state. And I was definitely a contributor to that. That's about as far as I'm willing to go. But what, what I was aware of was my moral bankruptcy. And I wasn't the worst person even I knew, but knowing knowing myself at, at a depth that, that others can't see and then learning in the good news of Jesus is it's for precisely those types of people that Christ has come and made this tremendously awe-inspiring and, and even indescribable sacrifice. And not to say that, you know, listeners here say, well, you know, when Wade and Craig talk about their background, I, I had a pretty vanilla upbringing, right? Well, that's fine too, right? There's not, you know, the grace of God isn't only available for the worst and the worst of the worst. But what it does is it demonstrates that if the grace of God is going to reach someone like me, then everyone between me and, and, and God, right, if we put a moral spectrum on it, um, then the grace of God is sufficient to reach them. But it all it all centers in Christ. It's not it's not sentiment. It's not positivity. It's not it's not religion for religion's sake. It's not faith because of the psychological benefits. It's saying, well, Christ is a true historic figure that lived and said some pretty tremendous things. He made some staggering claims. He claimed to have authority over nature, over demons, over disease. I mean, Jesus's life is one spectacular event after another. But certainly the most spectacular claim that Jesus ever made, and Wade, I, I'm sure you would know this and, and you would acknowledge this, was that he would rise from the dead. And, you know, based upon that one claim, everything else he said would either be verified or he would be dismissed. You know, Galilee and Judea were crawling with self-proclaimed prophets and messiahs in the day of Jesus. He wasn't the only one raising the ire of the Romans or the Pharisees. That was a permanent problem. Where Jesus stands apart, of course, is he verifies he was God in human form. He was truly man, truly divine. He died upon the cross where I, you know, my sins had brought upon me that penalty. Christ takes it upon himself. And there, that's the grace that we're, we're referring to. And of course, robustly verifying all of those claims is his physical resurrection from the grave, which, of course, the coming weekend will give us chances to commemorate. So it really is a it, it's a tremendous unless Easter's at a different time in the U.S. I'm pretty sure we're all globally <laughs> celebrating. Easter well, we, we've actually weekend. been having a discussion. We're publishing a book mm -hmm. called um, The Coming of the Glory, uh, Volume 3. We'll have Eileen Maddox on the show again in the near future. She's been on before, um, but the publication date you know, we were targeting Easter and then we decided, you know, to maybe target Passover and, um, and they're a month apart, you know, That's and right. um, yeah. it's the same holiday. I'm sorry. It's the same holiday, right? It should be <laughs> on the same day, but we have different calendars, right? And yeah, so it, right. it's not so much that Easter is celebrated on a different day in the U.S., um, mm. but that there's there's a divergence here between Yes. Yeah. The Jewish celebration of the Passover, which mm -hmm. is the day the lamb was slain and mm -hmm. Jesus being the lamb. Right. And That's right. it's the same <laughs> festival. Uh, yeah. Well, Easter, mm -hmm. no, because Easter celebrates his resurrection, not his death. But you mm -hmm. get the point. It's I do. Yeah. You know, even even um, then you have the whole debate about three days and three nights. Right. Well, we know it mm -hmm. wasn't a month anyway. And I don't want to get into Correct. the three day debate because no. I have <laughs> some very strong opinions there. That I believe are, are are verifiable, but um, no. So, but I do want to I do want to mention because the audience knows I'm a Baha'i, and we also um, air the show on the Baha'i Clearwater channel and some mm -hmm. other Baha'i channels. So I feel like I, I need to address this point uh, right. yeah. of Jesus' resurrection. The Baha'i mm -hmm. interpretation of that is slightly different. Now, mm -hmm. I'll remind all my Baha'i friends that. The, the guidance from the founders of the Baha'i faith is to not engage in a debate on this discussion because mm -hmm. when people argue religion, they are both wrong. So if we are the, are the cause of an argument, not only are we wrong, we are leading someone else astray by encouraging them to argue with mm -hmm. us. Right? And so I'm not presenting this by way of argument, but, I'm, but, I, but I also must feel free to fully express my perspective in that context. So the perspective yeah. is this. Jesus' resurrection is absolutely verifiable because mm -hmm. every king of every civilized nation for hundreds of years bowed their knee and was coronated in the name of Jesus Christ. His ascendancy was so complete that he transformed the world. The mm -hmm. evidence 
of what he said and of his resurrection is all around us. Even this article, which I'm, I'm going to, well, we'll get to it in a minute. This article that I published yeah. today, we're going to, we're going to first show your book before we go to the next commercial break. We'll show my article later is talking about the Judeo Christian foundations of America. One nation under God mm -hmm. and recognizes that resurrection recognizes that Jesus ascended to the right hand of God's throne and continued to carry out the will of the father. Um, so there's, there is some daylight here between mm -hmm. the views of Baha'is and the views you expressed. I'm seeking to minimize that daylight and say that we both agree that Jesus was resurrected yeah. and, and was completely transcendent. And in his, after his death, he transformed the world. Mm -hmm. Hard to argue with that, right, Wade? <laughs> right. <laughs> Just look so, around. So, um, which obviously he couldn't have done if he was simply, um, none of his promises were fulfilled. Mm. Um, but, so we will go to break, but before we do, I'm gonna quickly show a screenshot of your book because we didn't, for some reason, we didn't have a video. So, um, while I while I'm showing this, and this is the book we'll give away, and I and I saw a comment earlier from from Taz Z who said, um, and I gotta I gotta go back and see it here. Uh, by the way, in case the audience doesn't know, um, depending on what platform you're viewing this on, you're not seeing all the comments. We see them all in the studio. And here's the comment from Tazzy that caught my eye many, many comments ago. Where my book at? Because <laughs> he won the book last week and he doesn't have it yet. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming I'm assuming Tazzy that you sent the email to info at soupllc.com uh, with your address and uh, the book should be on its way to you. Um, and if it's not, I will look into it. But we're going to be giving away a copy of um, of Craig's book tonight. So tell us just a little bit more about that practical nature, the challenge you have of actually planting a church. What goes into planting a church mm. and um, and how does that work? Yeah, and I will say in Australia, it's quite unique because Australia is, as far as as far as faith is concerned, it's quite an unyielding soil. It's not fertile uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But what goes into it here really is just to establish something of a core group. It could be a family, two families, something small, and to commence some something akin to public worship services where we can just get the word out to the community, we can visit people, assist them in their need, and welcome along to a Sunday worship service where hopefully they're refreshed and encouraged and challenged and they find something of, of a community of faith where they feel like they can belong. So we're not restrictive over who can attend the church that we plant. We're quite open to anyone and everyone. We're, we're also committed to what we stand for. We're not we're not wishy-washy in that, well, anyone can come and we believe anything. We, we think anyone should be able to turn up and should be able to be challenged in their presuppositions and some of their, their faith conclusions, but it is a dialogue as well. So we want to have those conversations and encourage people in growth and however that means for them. But we exalt Christ as Lord. We proclaim the good news of Jesus. We turn to the scripture, trusting them as, a, as an infallible record of the words of Christ and the works of Christ. And, uh, and it just really, honestly, Wade, the key ingredient is a lot of patience and a lot of time. It takes a long time to build anything anything resembling a church here in Australia. And I, I knew that going in, so I'm fully committed and I'm excited about even the even the small growth that we've experienced. We've been almost running a year now, and it really has been a wonderful time. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Well, we're going to go to a, uh, a quick full commercial break here after having shown your book. And um, when we come back, um, we'll dive into some additional questions. Don't go anywhere. Um, looking forward very much, um, Craig, to, uh, to hearing more from you about all of these topics. Discover the world's religious traditions like never before with Ocean 2.0 Reader. Our custom ebook reader is designed for exploration and study with an immersive audio integrated reading experience and powerful research tools available on all platforms including web, Windows, macOS, Linux, Android, and iOS. Experience the benefits of immersive reading by combining ear and eye with improved comprehension and vocabulary acquisition. 
Our Interfaith Library features books from various religions, so you can have access to a wealth of knowledge. Try Ocean 2.0 Reader today and elevate your reading experience. And um, thank you to that sponsor. I, that, that app, I'll go ahead and throw the QR code onto the screen if we have it. Yes, we do. Um, you can point your phone at that. You can download it. I've personally used this app um, within my family. I think um, uh, other family members have used it too, even my kids. Um, it takes just a little bit of getting used to in terms of all of the various features, but it's really powerful um, in, in the way that, you know, it's an audio book of, of all these books are available by audio, but they are, they are imminently more searchable and imminently more customizable as to how they're read to you. Um, so great for research, great for just general learning and general study. Um, and uh, I wanted to make sure that we uh, we do justice to to that sponsor there. So, Craig, um, what are what are some of the challenges and um, some of the um, uh, successes that you've experienced in your work? And, um, and is that going to change at all with the completion of your doctorate or, or, or how has your doctorate helped you um, having done that program now with with your work down there in Australia? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think as you were <clears throat> as you were asking that, Wade, I was reminded of a remark my doctoral supervisor, he must have made dozens of times throughout this journey of mine that a doctoral dissertation is not there to establish a premise. It's there to ask a question. And in other words, what he's trying to say is that you should be coming into this research journey looking to learn something specific and something new. And a lot of people, maybe it was true for me, probably it was true for me. That's why he kept repeating this, this aphorism to me. You come in thinking you want to establish a premise, like you think you already know the answer, but you want to go ahead and do some robust uh, doctoral research to, to verify it. That really isn't the right attitude. And I think it was a bit of a journey for me to kind of customize with that new reality that I am doing doctoral research and now I'm at the, at the very end of it, but the journey was about learning something new for me and then advancing knowledge in, in the academic field. That's a very important component of doctoral research. So when it comes to church planting in Australia and particularly conservative, theologically conservative churches, so that's big view of God, big view of scripture, they kind of hold to the inerrancy of, of the Bible as, as God's word. Churches of that nature, as I said earlier, they have struggled and there's some, there's some some good reasons why. I hate saying good reasons, but uh, there are reasons why that can be pretty obvious. There, there isn't a lot of adaptability. There's sometimes there's a gatekeeperish mindset. There's a few other variables there. But I had to keep reminding myself, although I've been a pastor in Australia in these kinds of churches myself for a couple of decades, I need to still be open and willing to let the research speak for itself. What What is the data telling me? And then how do I implement that in, in thinking about not just my own church planting endeavors, but assisting other pastors and ministers who want to get into this field, who want to emerge in this work successful, what can the data that I'm able to collate and interpret, how can it help them? And I think in the Australian context, some of those findings will be very relevant. Even in some parts of the US, I'm thinking of the, you know, the extreme Northeast, the Pacific Northwest, parts that culturally are similar to Australia. I'll say this way, <coughs> pastoring in upstate. What? You're New saying York. parts of America are similar? No, couldn't be. That's heresy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, even upstate New York is Bible Belt. You, you, no, to you're gonna you're gonna upset the Australians more than you get upset, upset the Americans <laughs> with that one. <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's true. But uh, you know, it's it, there, there is some there's some connective tissue there, right? Like we kind of yeah. have similar identities. There's 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 a British underpinning to to kind of values and, and justice in society, but there's also a religiosity. Well, I got I got to pause much. you there because because this goes back to discussions you and I had yeah. earlier, and you and you said something so profound found based on your awareness and understanding of the uh, history and the different history it had mm -hmm. and i don't remember it but it had something to do with the fact that that we defeated the british and you didn't you you rememained them or we are some, british yes yeah yeah we but, but, we, <laughs> but unpack that briefly why that matters and what what yeah. the profundity is of that yeah i, I when i was pastoring in, in east texas uh, had some, you know, uh, to their back teeth, you know, rigid Republican types uh, and and beautiful people, of course. I'm not here to criticize anyone particularly, um, but they would say things like, "Why, why are you, why didn't you guys fight off the British?" And I said, "You know, we 
we are the British. We were wearing the red coats. I don't understand what you like. Australians don't see ourselves as this, <laughs> as this kind of this anomaly. We're an appendage of, of the British Empire. The majority of Australians are still even monarchists. So we have we have referendums regularly here in Australia every every few years to to sort of test public sentiment. And the majority of Australians still believe that King Charles, um, current King Charles III on the throne of the British Empire, is our legitimate king. Um, now. You know, uh, figurehead, uh, political figure. Of course, we, we have our own prime minister, but living in Texas, it was kind of hard to convey that to say that we don't see ourselves as needing a revolution. We see Australia as as something very distinct. It, we're not, we're not, we're not the UK. We're not going to say we are. We are distinct. But Australians are also extremely proud of their convict heritage. If you live in Australia and you grew up here and you're able to trace your family lineage back to back to some convict, that's a that's a note of high pride in Australian society, because also there's a sense in which um, Australians kind of embody this. We we are our own as well, and, and so it's it's a very unique thing. It, it's quite distinct. And when I lived in and worked in Texas, I I found it difficult to negotiate that and to to communicate that with with my Texan brothers and sisters. But then again, also, I think what's kind of endemic in being Texan is to be very Texas centric. That's an important part of your identity. And it's a part that should be celebrated. But as you mentioned before about Alaska, it can sometimes get you in trouble. I had many Texans tell me Texas is the largest state in the US. Now I'm an Australian and I already know it's not, it's not the biggest state in the US. And then I'll have to tell them in the state I'm from in Australia is 40% bigger than Texas. Like you guys have a nice, cute little state here. It's wonderful. Uh, I would never say that, of course, I'd, I'd be staring down the barrel of a six shooter. But, um, you know, I, I felt like um, Texans have this very Texas view and it is a beautiful thing to live there and be among them. It's really wonderful. I bought into it. Our family were part of it. We'd even call ourselves Texan, but very much Australian. And to be Australian is something very distinct. Well, you know, what people don't know who have never been to Texas, the Texans are amazingly welcoming people. Oh, yeah. Goodness, yeah. Yeah, yeah so hospitable, very welcoming, um, but, you know, extremely proud and and, right. and and for the right reasons of of who, who they are as a people and what makes them unique. And it's a beautiful thing. But you would sometimes find yourself in, in awkward social situations, of course, because Texans have that highest degree of pride in their, their Texan nature um, and maybe sometimes are not as aware of the goings on of the rest right. of the world. And I think a good Texan would say, and so we should be. Of course, that's not unintentional, <laughs> yeah, who, right? Who, who cares what, what goes on in the rest yeah. of the world, right? But yeah. anyway, yeah. Um, I, I actually derailed you. You were saying something and now I can't, I can't help you get back to where you were. But if you remember where you were when I mm. derailed you, to talk about um, you know the, that difference, um, it had to yeah. do with the 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 opportunity, the the great thing, the the um, challenges you've had, the successes you've had, and, and mm. how the doctoral dissertation, its practical nature, plays mm. in to that. And you were yeah, you were sharing that you were sharing that um, one of the big learnings was that um, y you weren't intended to establish a premise; you were intended to ask a question and maybe maybe yeah. figure it out. That's right. Yeah, and I think what I what I learned through pastoring and serving in, in, in church life in the US, first Texas and then upstate New York, and as different as those cultures are, there were tremendous insights that, that can be garnered by it. But one of the things that I found surprising was when I got to upstate New York, um, they would talk about themselves as though they're at the, they're at the very fringe of, uh, of secular, anti, you know, anti-faith, anti-Christian society. And I would say, have you not ever visited France or, you know, or, or Australia, <laughs> uh, because it, it's, it's Bible Belt compared to where I grew up here in Australia. I mean, I right. when I first visited and I saw a, a, a seemingly healthy and wealthy looking church on every street corner, I said, you will not see that in Australia. You can drive through a city of a couple million people in Australia and you might see two or three churches. Um, whereas, you know, in the US, even in those parts that are considered pretty post-Christian, uh, they still have quite a saturation of faith and maybe a greater variety. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe not. Um, you know, Australia is just a different animal entirely. And, and because you've had experience in Northern Europe, you've kind of got a taste and you've got an experience of that, that that a lot of Americans probably don't quite have. And again, a lot of Americans probably see the rest of the world as peripheral to what's happening in America. And there may be some truth to that. The political machinations of the US will have knock on effect and flow on effect for the the rest of us, particularly in 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 the West, um, my wife is is she's Finnish. She's born in Sweden, and I remember I was at a pastors' conference in Brooklyn, in New York City, um, 
And the pastor said, oh, Finland, is that, uh, is that an island in the Pacific? Now, my wife is fair skin, blonde hair. I don't know what he thought she looked Polynesian. But we have these encounters every now and then that sort of give us a I'm reminded. Of, well, I'm reminded of the question that I've been asked so many times in my life. You know, you're Swedish. Do you speak Swiss? <laughs> do you speak Swiss? I'm like, you know, because I lived in Switzerland. So I'm like, first of all, there's no Swiss. Yeah, there's there's a four Swiss different, language. <laughs> there are four different languages. <laughs> and right. no... Swedes don't speak it, even if there they was don't. such a thing, because sure. it's a different country. But anyway, um, this th there was a, there was I did go through an anti-American phase, and that's why I went mm. to Europe for exactly all those reasons of mm. my arrogance and superiority, looking down my nose at these ignorant Americans, right? And of course, I was born in Canada, um, mm. <laughs> but. But no, I, I celebrate. I celebrate America. I celebrate all the Americans and all their unique mm. quirks, just like people oh, yeah. all around yeah. the, the planet. But anyway, um, one last question for you. We're sure. we're at time, but we're going to go a little bit over time. I apologize to to you, to me, and to everybody else. I want to go a little no bit problem. over time. I want to ask one more question, and then we got to get to some of the comments and award that book. The last question is this: You talked about the inerrancy of, of yes. scripture, yeah. and. Um, your your theology degree is more practical, but surely you are aware that there are errors in Scripture. Um, yes and no. Yes and no. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, a, there I'm are, aware that there translations are, have errors. Yes. Well, not, not only that. Thing. Not only that. There are there are additions. Then they're not Scripture. Yes. So the right. Scripture is what the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets and apostles to write. Any after addition or any okay. Any, Okay, Scribal so you're not you're not talking not about the inerrancy of the Bible. That's why I said scripture, because that's the, an important distinction. Yeah, I, so I who like gets, the English who, who gets version. to decide what scripture is. Jesus does, of course. Yeah. Okay, but how did how did Jesus do that? How does Jesus do that? Yeah, that's a that's a brilliant question. I'll and by the way, by the way, yeah. I I am also a believer in the inerrancy of Scripture, but it is a okay. thorny topic, and a lot of oh, people yeah. um, have a right to question it. And everyone um, has a right to question it by yeah, by everyone. by elevating the level of discussion. I think it's actually mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. Yeah, so let me thorny, give you although thorny. let me give you the elevator pitch if I can on this. I would say Absolutely. that if I submit to Christ's lordship as my savior and, and, and the king of kings, then I must imbibe his view of the scripture. Jesus gave, he gave his full endorsement to what we call the Hebrew scriptures that he used and he spoke of. He was not shy calling them the yes. words of God, the, the scriptures the, of the, God. The, 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 um... The Torah, the writings, and the prophets, the law, That's right. the prophets, yeah. and the writings, all yeah. three of those yeah. he validated. Yeah. Yes, That's correct. Right. And he would say to his distractors, his detractors, yeah. he would say, have you not read what God has said to you? So right. there's a high view of verbal plenary inspiration that Jesus, he reinforced for what we would call today Old Testament. Of course, it wasn't called that then, but you know, right. we're, we're using modern language. It's anachronistic, but I think it makes yeah. sense. And then I would say Jesus gave provision. He gave provision for a New Testament by endorsing and appointing his apostles to write an infallible record of his life, works, and words. And then he would say, whoever does not receive your message does not receive me, nor the one who sent me. So when I, I'm not being tried. Well, and, and, and interestingly, here's, a, here's another little, you know, of yeah. course, this is circular reasoning when we use the Bible to prove the Bible, but still, nonetheless, the book of Revelation you know, known as the revelation of St. John. It's not the revelation of St. John. The very first oh, words Jesus are the Christ. revelation yeah. of Jesus Christ, That's which obviously saying. came after his death. And then you have these yes, markers in the book of Revelation that do exactly what you said, which is validate yes. the authenticity yeah. and the authority of Scripture. If I can make one comment, Wade, about what you said about the circular reasoning, I, I don't deny that. All I say is that all ultimate authorities are self-verifying. You can't you can't tell me you believe in logic and then I say, well, prove logic and you would use logic and I accuse you. You can't do that because that's circular reasoning, right? I recognize that when we elevate something into the position of ultimate authority, we allow its self-verifying voice to stand. It's not the only piece of evidence or line of inquiry or, or, or you know, affirmation, but we do that. And because the Bible is my ultimate authority, when I say because the Bible says so, that's not the end of the story. There's so much more we can bring to that conversation, but I allow the self-attesting voice of scripture to stand because I think that's where we find the voice of Christ. And I love the way that you unpack that. Thank you so much for that. 
and thank you also for the confidence and not being defensive about it, which is an awesome no. example for all of us, right? Um, okay, so thank you. We've quickly handled that. So let's um, let's and, and awesome answer. Thank you so much. I mean that you, that that could make a great little um, for for my team. Do a little uh, video of that segment, <laughs> right? Let's go market that segment. That's cool. To get people yeah. to come watch you. Okay, so um, I don't know if on the right there you're able to see some of the quotes. I can share some of them. Um, Please share. I can't see them. Yeah. Okay. V very early on, I mean, there's tons of comments there. I'll only be able to share a few. Sandra Williams um, was was very quick to show that we have Minnesota in the house. Um, I earlier shared comments from Brian, you know, endorsing my T-shirt idea of I believe in science who needs evidence. And I would further I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do this now because I said I would, even though we're over time. Oops, sorry. Um, I'm going to share quickly my article um, that I just got published today. A little plug for the um, Atlantic Playbook, who um, has honored me by allowing me and I want to certainly support them as well. Um, so here is the article uh, that was published there today. Biblical justice, that's me and my younger self, you know, not to not to be too dishonest, um, but I did did look that way when I was a few years younger. Biblical justice, the Judeo-Christian foundation of Western civilization, the concept of justice within the Judeo-Christian tradition. And what I want to highlight here, um, I talk about the um, I talk about the uh, parable that I talked about earlier, Cain and Abel, and then the um, prodigal son. But what I want to what I want to highlight right here is right from this article, Hebrews chapter eleven, verse one, because here we have that concept of evidence, right? And interestingly, in this description of faith, um, faith in shaping our perception of justice refers to evidence. And evidence is, of course, a judiciary term. You go to court and you got nothing if you don't have evidence. And um, I, that's another reason I really like what you did there, Craig, when you defended the ability to use the Bible itself to prove the Bible. And in fact, God says, prove me now herewith. Mm. He asks us to put him to the test, right, and to prove him. So there's another example of the inherent proof within the Bible of its own authority. For, mm -hmm. for somebody to write that down in a book and say, here it is, here's the maxim, here's the theorem, prove it. And uh, it's living and it's alive and, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not just something because it's true, it's not just true because it's true. It's also true because there is a divine being who will enforce the truth of it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right here, right now, for anybody who who takes him up on his promises. Um, so uh, other comments. Um, here's one um, from, from quite a while ago um, when we were talking about, um, well, I forget exactly what we were talking about, but Anything that um, comes between us and God reminded um, Jesus mm -hmm. is Lord of the love of money. The love of anything more than God would apply as well to the concept that was being said at the time. Um, here was Sandra again chiming in with an amen. <laughs> um, so... Uh, this was an important contribution from Lord Cole. One of the things that Jesus did, he was, a, when we were talking about how did he mediate, he also mediated a new covenant. Amen. Yeah. Um, Hebrews 7.25. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what that verse says. Do you? I mean, I, obviously we could look it up, but offhand? Not offhand, no. Not offhand, no. So, um Hebrews 7.25, if somebody wants to throw that in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was an interesting discussion about um, Pilate. Mm. Pilate is not portrayed properly in the gospel, um, that he was quite ruthless, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Pilate of Roman history did not have much of a conscience. <laughs> 
I think the Gospels portray that, right? I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if that is an inaccurate presentation of the Gospel, but history is showing that Pilate was in Judea as something of a punishment. He was a problem maker. And uh, you got sent to the backwaters of that part of the world from the Roman Empire was a dis demonstration that you were not thought of very highly. And uh, Pilate did a pretty awful job governing that region and wasn't long there, wasn't there very long at all. Yep. Um, past present um, had a comment here. <laughs> not sure why it would m matter. The guy came back to life. <laughs> This was talking about Jesus and his resurrection. Yes, um, yes. But I can't remember exactly what he was commenting to. I'm just, I'm just trying yeah. to show you know some of the different comments here mm. um, to give you a sense. Um, yeah. And I, and I'm you know for every one comment I'm showing, I'm skipping over 15. Um, <laughs> Good luck. Uh, <laughs> Gotta try and moderate those. Yeah. Um, well, I, I love, I love, love, love that uh, the audience was interacting with each other and so yeah. involved here. Um, Um, somebody was saying you have faulty logic. So if reasoning, so if playing sip is still there, I don't know what the context was of this. There's a better argument that would send a clearer message. I think he might've been referring to the internal logic poor mm -hmm. portion, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Hard to say. Um, Here we go. Thank you so much um, to I'm set. Hebrews 725. Consequently, is he, he's able to save to the uttermost those uttermost, who draw near yeah. to God through him, since yeah. he always lives to make intercession for them. Mm -hmm. um, it was for the argument about how many days he was down. So this may have been, you have faulty reasoning. There's a better argument that would send a clearer message. Huh? I don't know because Wade, you had said that you have some interesting yeah. views, but you didn't want to get into it, but he must, I don't, you didn't actually explain your reasoning. I don't think we got into right. it at all, but right. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Well, I think, but it might've been the fact that um, Passover and Easter were a month apart. Um, yeah. The three days and three nights, there's, there is um where do you stand on that because um I, I, between, I hold the conventional view i hold the conventional view yeah, in other I've words that, in detail but i can't yeah so the conventional view being um he was crucified approximately when friday morning friday morning i don't think yeah. that's a conventional view right yeah and he rises Sunday well okay morning. okay he was crucified yeah. right but he died yeah. approximately when uh friday 3 p.m Right. So because it the, the time couldn't start from the time of crucifixion, it would have to start from the time of his death. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it, well, it could be crucifixion because e either, point, either, way, either way, either yeah. way, the way the days were counted, the daylight portion. Yes. Whether it was in the morning or before sunset, that's still that that day. But yeah. I guess you could count you could count that whole day then. You do, Whereas, yeah, and they do, yeah. Right. There's, there's so they, count, so that, they count that as the first day, and I, I had yes. actually not heard that argument. Yeah. To be honest, that's interesting. I'd not well, heard somebody try to say, "Well, it started when he was crucified, not when he died." Yeah. And this is this is um good biblical examples elsewhere in Scripture where part days are counted as full days. Because of our kind of post enlightenment view of counting and measuring, we take one to be a full one. We don't usually take part of one to represent the full one as a synecdoche. key. So I think, again, the conventional view makes the most sense. But there's no way I would divide fellowship over this or, or even get into much of a debate. It's interesting, but I take Jesus' death 3 p.m. thereabouts Friday afternoon, resurrection Sunday morning. Okay, so, I mean, the discussion is that's, you know, the morning and the evening were the first day. In Genesis right. one, yeah, yeah, right. That's how a day yeah. is counted, and that's how the that's Jews. Why, that's, that's how why the it's Jews counted that way. days, right? Yeah, it's right. worded that way so you don't count one hour as a day. Right, it goes out of its way to make pains to say morning and evening constitute this full day in creation. Right, but other great examples in Scripture show that part of a day is counted as a day, and no right. one seems to bat an eyelid in the ancient world. Right, it was perfectly appropriate. Right. To do so, that, yeah. so, so let's count that first day. Yeah. Um, as the daylight portion, 
and then yeah. the evening portion after yeah. sunset. So the now you're at sunset. Saturday yeah. morning. Yes. Um, Saturday and Saturday night would then be the second day. The third day. Saturday night's the third day. Uh, well, no, the morning and the evening. You know, there, there are no examples of counting two, counting one day as two days. Right. No, so, so the morning yeah, and the Friday evening the would never count as two days. Your, your, your argument yeah. is, you would count, you would count the evening as a full day. So what you, yes. what you're saying yeah. then is, no, but, but see, the morning and the evening, Friday day. And Friday night would be the first day. You couldn't count. No. Thursday night and Friday day is a full day in Jewish counting of days. Sunset is the next day. That's why Sabbath starts sunset every Friday. Not Right. But he wasn't Saturday. crucified on a Thursday. No, no. That's right. Friday, third, Friday morning, he's crucified. Yes. Right. All right. Let's not get into this. Let's, let's not. Because we don't even know if that was what the question was. No, yeah, um, yeah. I don't want to do this. Yeah. All right. So Planksip is saying maybe that there was a different. Therefore, he's a, Planksip was talking about um, the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ con contrasting mm -hmm. with the mortal and temporary priesthood. Yep. I don't know if you can see these comments. So I, I can't. Start. But as you read them, I'm following. Yeah. Can you see it now? It's on the screen. Uh Yes, but I can't. It's I'm using my phone. It's so small. I would have okay. to get up. This verse emphasizes the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ, contrasting with right. the mortal and temporary priests of the, of the Old priesthood. Testament. Talking about yeah. Hebrews tw seven twenty five. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, it highlights Jesus' unique role as intercessor, yeah. because he lives forever, can provide eternal salvation to those. So I guess yeah. this is so. This is what Planksip was saying. Um, there's a better discussion of this piece mm -hmm. um a better argument um <laughs> uh, another reason why mondays suck okay <laughs> <laughs> good comment <laughs> all right so i i don't know if any of these um any of these comments jump out at you if there's somebody in particular you'd like to pick uh Here's here's one that, you know, perhaps uh, will really appeal to you. OK, um, why would it matter how long it took? He did it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I, I actually think that the gospel authors are trying to write with almost like that anticipation, that motivation. Yeah. Um, there's got to be a way that Jesus demonstrates he's repeating the sign of Jonah. But the math doesn't have to be perfect in order for the redemptive reality to, to be perfected. And I think that comment encapsulates that well. Well, I think also what it does is, you know, most people think Jesus spoke in parables to make the meaning clearer, and he himself oh, no. said the what opposite. He said. <laughs> he, did. Right. he said, yes, that's right. Right. And so some of these things, and I, and I had this debate with, well, not debate, I had this discussion with the imam around Isaac versus Ishmael, because mm. Muslim tradition is that Ishmael was the son who was sacrificed, mm. Mm. and... Um, Hebrew and Christian tradition is it was Isaac. But going into the actual text, neither the Quran nor the Bible names the son. Mm. In the Hebrew verses, it doesn't use the word Isaac. Mm. And in the Quran, it doesn't use the, the name Ishmael. The Quran and the Bible both describe Abraham's sacrifice in slightly different ways. Mm. And um, you have to go into the original language to sort of parse out whether it's talking about Ishmael or Isaac. Of course, yeah. elsewhere, and this would get to your point about the inerrancy of Scripture, you know, the Bible whereas, tells us elsewhere. Yeah. well, um, but does it? One would have to go into the original languages in each case to see whether yeah. it I is in the original. Or it explicit. says Isaac. It yeah. says where does Isaac it say? Where does it say Isaac? In Hebrews, it discusses the. The sacrifice, right? Well, that's something to maybe look up. Yeah, yeah. For our next show, Wade, when we get together again, <laughs> Lord willing. <laughs> but the point is, and here's the point, not to argue about yeah. it, but why would it matter, right? But it's almost yeah. as though God puts these things in as tests 
to yeah. see whether we're going to let these differences of opinion divide mm. us. Is mm. that going to be enough to send them to hell? Are you going to establish these doctrinal litmus tests? Of course not. To yeah. determine who's in and who's out? Mm. Because guess what? Religions have done so. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the Pharisees did so. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, if you agree, I think past present and this comment might indeed be the one that should get the copy of your book. Lock it in. I like it. All right. <laughs> I like so, it. Um, so past present, congratulations. Um, I'll, I'll put the comment in here. We should um, have this uh, preset text to the future because I hate it when I have to type this. But anyway, congrats. Mm -hmm. Send an email to info at soupllc.com to receive your copy, compliments of something or other publishing, our sponsor, one of our sponsors. Now I'm mistyping I before E except after, right? Don't judge me on my spelling here. <laughs> it's hard to do on the fly. Look, I, I admit. Yeah, exactly. Especially in these little windows that, you yeah, know. Yeah. Okay. So now I have one item left to do. Thank you, Craig. Just stay with us for another minute. I have no one more responsibility, which is to tell our viewers who they can expect to come and watch next week at this same time, same place. Uh, tune in next week for Angela and Charles Todd. Um, Angela and and uh, Charles Todd have um, a, an incredible journey to share from bankruptcy to prosperity, all while aligning with God's principles. Discover how they apply simple yet powerful spiritual and practical strategies to prosper in every area of life, including finances and health. Um, this might be a little contrast to, uh, to your presentation today, and um, we'll dig into it. But one of the reasons we have them here is because they've written a children's book that teaches financial literacy um, to children. And we'll talk about how to uh, prepare ourselves uh, to be successful in the material world, not only in the spiritual world. So we will have Angela and, uh, I'm sorry, was it Charles? <coughs> um, no, Angela. Yes, Angela and Charles Todd um, next week here. You don't want to miss that. So Craig, any uh, last minute comments, thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with before we conclude for tonight? Yeah, I think... Um... I just want to read Hebrews eleven seventeen because I promised you that it mentions Isaac's name. By faith, Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promise was in act of offering up his only son. Just, I didn't want to throw that out there and leave it, but that's not a good parting final comment, Wade. Well, Let me say no, thank but, you. but see, that wasn't, you, you had mentioned that in the Hebrew scriptures, i.e. going back to the Old Testament, and I was referring to the Old Testament in which, the story of Abraham, which is where I believe he is not mentioned by name. You're, which you're right. What I said was in Hebrews, not in Hebrew. I said. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought, Hebrew, I thought you said Isaac. I thought you said in Hebrew. No, no, no. But so, we know that. Well, so so was so was that Aramaic then, and is it in the original language there? Because again, yeah, it could Greek, be not Aramaic, there Greek. as well. Right. No, it's Isaac. It's in the Greek. It's in the original. Okay. There's no question. If you embrace the scriptures, Old and New Testament as as true in God's word, you have no real margin there to argue it's anyone other than Isaac. Yeah. But my, my parting remarks, thank you, Wade, for having me on. Thank you to your audience. Hopefully I get to hear from them and you sometime soon. This has been a wonderful chat. I've really enjoyed myself. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, I'd love to have you back and dig deeper into some of these topics and yeah. learn. Um, is there anything that you'll be doing in the next um, month or two that's uh, particularly interesting in terms mm -hmm. of church planting? There probably is. Let me not go on record now. Let me shoot you an email. I don't want to. I don't want to promise and guarantee then withdraw. But yeah, let's let's keep in touch, Wade, and we'll we'll talk. Yeah. Well, and uh, you know, for those of us in our audience who who like to pray, um, you know, we might yeah. invite them to pray for your success. Thank you, and that would be so appreciated. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Tune in next week uh, for more uh, with created in the image of God. And until then, may God be with you. <laughs>